Hi, I'm Rohit. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Stilt. Uh, today we have Nupur with us. Nupur is the co-founder and CEO of OTA Info, and it provides AI to secure connected devices like automobiles, cameras, and, and other devices that are coming online uh, from cyber attacks. And uh, Nupur was also uh, also went through YC in the summer 16 batch and uh, I've been doing this for quite a, quite some time now. Yeah. Good to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was an awesome introduction and I'm excited for the conversation today. Great. Uh, so let's just start with your background. Um, you are originally from India. So give us a sense of how did you move to the US? What were you doing in India before, before you moved here? Sure. Um, so I was born in Gujarat, which is on the westernmost part of India mm -hmm. in a city called Surat. And I stayed there for un until seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And in eighth grade, my full family decided to move here and uh, have been in Cupertino ever since. And what year did you move here? How yeah, you I was here in 2007. 2007. So you've been here 12 years 12 now. Years, yeah. Cool. Um, so you moved here in eighth grade. You went to high school, middle school, high school here, yeah, yeah. Uh, all in Cupertino. Or did you move around? Exactly. Nope. Same place, same play, uh, house location. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. For uh, the past 12 years. <laughs> and, and what was what school did you go to? Yeah, I went to Lawson. Uh, then I went to Monta Vista High School right. and did my first two years of college at De Anza, which mm -hmm. is literally across the street from where I stay, so mm -hmm. it's still very local. Right. <laughs> and then moved to USC for about six months mm -hmm. and before I decided to take some time off mm -hmm. uh, to work on a startup. So, and what were you majoring at De Anza? Yeah. So I was doing a dual degree program mm -hmm. for associates and uh, we had social leadership and change mm -hmm. in the community mm -hmm. was one and the other was business administration. Got it. And how did you move to USC? So how much time did you spend at the ends of doing what and why did you decide to move farther to right. USC? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a long way, right? I was in yeah. like two mile radius. <laughs> yeah. No, no. So the plan was because De Anza only is a two-year program okay. and they don't offer anything beyond two years. So it's just associates you get and then you will have to transfer to a four-year institution. Mm -hmm. And it was just a choice between the different universities I got accepted to. So I also did a few summer programs at Harvard and did internships at Stanford and got myself in uh, like all the different exposures as I could. And then... Mm -hmm. uh, when you moved to LA for USC. Oh, so you went to USC for six months? Yes. And uh, what did you do there? Why did you leave after six months? Right. Um, so I always had the entrepreneur bug mm -hmm. and I always wanted to do something uh, in that space. Mm -hmm. And when I was at USC, the startup environment was not as active as it is now mm -hmm. uh, in LA. And I would have to skip classes to go to those events in Santa Monica, right? And, and how far is that? Santa from? Monica was crazy. So here's the thing: USC is at a very interesting location. Okay. <laughs> All the highways that could possibly be like the major highways connect at USC. Nice. So if you had to go anywhere, even if it was during non-peak hours, you would always hit traffic. <laughs> so it was too well. Yeah, okay. but now they even have like a train that goes from USC to Santa Monica. Sorry. So lucky them. But at that point, we didn't have that uh, facility. Got it. So, uh, did you? So out. you always had the entrepreneur. Did you also start companies? Not com but like small business. That kids do things in school, yeah. like they sell <laughs> stuff. And they figure out a way to do to make some money. Uh, did you also do that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so. Actually, one of the first ones was inspired by my move to US. Mm -hmm. So in India, you know, the education system is much more focused mm -hmm. on um, learning, like, you know, memorizing things. Mm -hmm. The culture is not as practical and critical thinking is not enforced as much as it is here. Totally. So that was a huge contrast for me that I had to adjust to, right? Mm -hmm. Going from something that was okay, if you memorize these answers that are in the answer digest, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can copy it. You can even memorize essays and copy them. It was not encouraged, but like that's what people right. were doing. Right. Uh, and coming here, the teacher would ask me, what do you think? Right. And I'm like, shit, what do I think? Yeah, I think whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. 
So it was like a whole learning curve of even exploring right. yourself. Right. So my first startup was how do you bridge that gap, right? Mm -hmm. Make people think critically. If you are given a problem, what is the first thing that you say? It shouldn't be like, oh, these words sound familiar. This was the formula that is associated with. I'm going to copy the formula, put in the numbers and go from there. Actually understand that why am I using this formula? Mm -hmm. What is it that is being asked of me in the problem? And um, step by step, think it through. So that was the first entrepreneurial thing that I did. Got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so, so you did that and then you also left USC to start another business. Yes. Uh, how did that come about and what did your family sort of say yeah. you quit in college? Um, so that was crazy. I remember that moment exactly. <laughs> so I had come back home for my winter break. I'd already paid the fees for the next semester and you know. Right. And USC is not cheap. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, how I paid for it, that's another story. Okay. We can get to it later in the podcast. But um, I basically uh, took that time mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, here's the deal. I'm not enjoying Los Angeles as much as I thought I would. I really miss the rigor of and the people and the kind of events that used to happen in Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I want to move. So the first thought was, why don't you transfer to another university, Stanford, Santa Clara University, all of that. And then I was like, no, I really, I feel like I have, want to dedicate six months of my time to figure out if there's a startup I can work on. Sure. And it was like a much more open conversation than I had anticipated with the parents. Mm -hmm. And um, they were like, sure. They were very supportive of the decision, which was really surprising for me. What year was that? <laughs> Um, I was a junior in college, so I was but, about 21. No, but what year? 2000? Oh, 2015. 2015. Okay, mm -hmm. so there were some startups getting popular in the Bay Area. Um, it's four years later, but yeah. still for especially parent, Indian parents to have their uh, children not... Uh, it was a huge step. <laughs> right, yeah, not complete college and, and, and get a, a cushy job at, at one of the big tech companies right. here, especially this, that's what they see around right. uh, everywhere, uh, is definitely a, a forward-thinking step on, on their front. That definitely. They, that they did I'm not, very thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pester you too much and they, they allowed right. you to do uh, what you wanted. So, so you decided you wanted to do a startup, you convinced your parents to do it. How did you go get the idea of what you wanted to do and how did you actually ended up uh, executing it? Sure. So at that time we were working on Replenish mm -hmm. and uh, the idea had stemmed from my brief internship at Stanford. Mm -hmm. So I was at the Goodman Simulation Lab mm -hmm. and I was helping coordinate different classes and literally all the doctors would come to practice on the robotic patient and mm -hmm. things like that. And during one of those sessions, paramedics had come to train with the robotic patient. And there was just so much chaos because they were maybe spending 5-10 minutes with the patient, but 30-40 minutes just debriefing as to what had happened in that 5-10 minute de like interaction. Hmm. And I was kind of taken aback, but I did discount it, saying that maybe they're training, things like that are happening. And uh, later on, the deeper I dug mm -hmm. into the whole industry, mm -hmm. the more I learned that that was the norm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Replenish addressed that issue of automating paperwork and helping them be compliant right. uh, faster. And you started that in 2015? 2015, yeah. And, but you went to uh, Y Combinator in 2016, yes. summer of 2016, so that's like August. Yeah. What what were you trying to prove in the in the meantime? How did what was your first product with with Rick Planish? Sure. Uh, um, so in the meantime, we actually were part of Founder Institute, and that was one of the reasons I extended much. the okay. six month uh, quote unquote leave of absence. Right. <laughs> and um, at that time, we were getting LOIs. I literally remember going to customers with a product. And there were paper like drawings, right? Right, of the product screenshots, and I was like, "Here you go. What do you think of this? Would you, if I made this, would you use this?" And we got LOIs based on paper drawings. Like I was, 
blown away that people like the need was big enough that people were willing to bet on paper drawings to solve it um yeah and and who was the who gave you the first set of where was it from yeah it was actually a local company uh, mm -hmm. called royal ambulance okay and i remember i was so happy like oh my god yeah. i'm meeting with royal ambulance right <laughs> and then you, and you took it to your parents it, it acted as a proof of exactly uh, validation. It, it, actually, it was a validation yeah. uh, of the idea cool so so how many how long did it take you to get your first loi yeah so the first few LOIs were really fast, right? Okay. But the challenge for us was I was a non-technical founder mm -hmm. and I had to build a product, mm -hmm. right? So yes, I can make a sale happen, all of that could happen, but now you have to deliver on all of that. Right. So uh, that was the stepping stone, right? Building the product, getting the team together. That was, I think, the second time I had worked with outsourced teams. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was recruit recruiting a technical co-founder all of that and where did you meet your co-founder yeah so at that time one of my friends was helping me out uh, so we were just in the library working mm -hmm. she was working on her master's class and i was working on my startup and, and where was it usc no library in Cupertino. okay so I'm, at this point i'm back okay. yeah. <laughs> working on this idea going through fi got it uh, yeah okay and so, so you recruited a technical co-founder, you, you got the LOIs beforehand yes. and then you are building the product. When did you launch your first product? Was it like during YC, yeah. before YC? Yeah, it was interesting because we got into YC when we didn't really have a proper product. Hmm. Um, so all of that happened post YC. Got it. And so as you're sort of uh, building the product, what... What was your YC interview like? I think YC likes to demo the product. Yeah. Uh, wh how did how did that go? Yeah. So YC interview was crazy. Um, it's only ten minutes, mm -hmm. and until you experience it, you don't realize how fast it right. goes by. No, I, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I remember it was two co-founders, and we were like, we have to prove that the need is there. We have these LOIs, but we should get a paramedic to join us. Mm -hmm. And usually, <laughs> IC doesn't allow you to get external people who are not co-founders to be right. in it. Right. So I recruited one of our amazing advisors, who's also a paramedic at the follow-up to so, uh, fire station. And I told him, you know, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to even stay, but I want you to come and show your face. <laughs> so we come in. There's Sam, there's Kirsty, and a bunch of other uh, founders, and I'm shaking hands with each one of them, and they're like, hello, we sit down on the chair, get a third chair for uh, the paramedic, and then they're like, I don't see a third founder in the application. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, no, no, he's not a founder, he's just our amazing uh, like spokesperson. Uh, user of our product. Exactly, user of the pro product. And they're like, sorry, we couldn't let let him stay. But like, right. it's fine. Go right. achieve. They met him. He's willing to come. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so that that obviously went well. Uh, yeah. You got in. How did you? What did you do after YC? How how was that uh, process of building product? Maybe signing more LOIs. Right. Uh, or or getting more customers. Right. Um, even like during YC and post YC was very different for us compared to our peers hmm. because when they were tracking metrics that were much more based on revenue mm -hmm. and customers and user base and monthly active users we were like okay this feature <laughs> this feature things like that so post yc we had a product that we we could give out and uh we onboarded about 200 ambulances and did a full case study and it perfected the product afterwards. But it was right. definitely a very different journey compared to all the other uh, people in our company. Right, and is it really difficult to sell to these ambulance companies? Because people's lives are at stake as they go yeah. through, uh, this, as the ambulances are picking them up and dropping them definitely. off at the hospital. How did you get over that uh, uh, sort of uh, difficulty? And what were the sales cycle like uh, yeah. for you guys? 
they were really long. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing to know about the ambulance industry was it's extremely fragmented. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you make a sale to one ambulance company, you have only made a sale to one ambulance company. There are no like network effects or, you know, if this company is using these people, it will be much more influenced to use it kind of thing. Um, and the sales cycle were at least a couple months long and uh, very small companies like having an ambulance company that was 100 ambulances big was like big. Uh, just big. give us a sense of how many of these companies are there in the US. Oh. <laughs> so there are 55,000 ambulance companies that exist and the average size for each ambulance company is 20. <laughs> 20. So, uh, so 20 units. 20 yeah, weeks. so like about uh, uh, 100,000 and then like a million yeah. people um, or a million ambulances uh, for 300 million people. So it's one crazy. ambulance for 300 people. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you, you did that and you did that for a while. You obviously sold, you, you built the product. How and when you decided that you are going to pivot or switch to uh, OTA, to your current idea of OTA info? Sure. Um, in the past few months, uh, we were really trying to figure out how could we get faster to the market, right? Mm -hmm. Because now we had a product ready uh, and we were working with 200 ambulance companies and mm -hmm. we were about to sign 500 more, mm -hmm. right? But that rigor was missing, right? Like if you are doing sales or maintaining a company you need to have a funnel that is big enough mm -hmm. where even if you don't have a direct point of contact that sale is still moving on right like or if you are receiving big enough returns for mm -hmm. the amount of one-on-one -on -one attention you are giving so we didn't fit in either one of those categories but we were very much mission driven right so we tried to find many alternatives that we could do to address that problem that existed or the need that existed. So we went to OEMs, we worked with Mahindra, a really big OEM in India, mm -hmm. right? To figure out, okay, can you put this inside your vehicle itself and sell? And it would be like a on and off situation where we use them as a sales channel. Right. And there were a lot of things that were ha happening, but it was moving much slower. And around that same time, my co-founder was involved in an open source project uh, called Upting. And one of a, a really big company reached out to him saying, okay, we want to be Upting compliant. Uh, what are you offering? And it really took us a second to realize that, you know, we have been spending so much time on replenish. Maybe it was time to take a step back and look at the bigger picture mm -hmm. like what other opportunities like what other skill sets do we have right now or what software have we built that can cater to a much bigger market and things like that so when we took that step back we realized that Uptain is becoming big now mm -hmm. and, and what is Uptain? Uh, yeah yeah so it's the next gen uh, framework okay. to uh, for automotive security Okay. Um, so so right is, now it, there are, is it uh, specifically for automotive industry? Yes. Okay. So Uptain was specific, is specifically for automobile industry, but uh, we decided to commercialize it and bring it, bring it out of uh, just the automotive industry because there are so many applications outside of it and it fits right in. Uh, yeah. So, so what's Uptain? Sure. So Uptain is a framework, open source framework. Uh, for automotive security and they're basically funded by DHS, Department of Homeland Security and uh, Department of Transportation in Michigan. Like mm. These two entities reached out to them saying that vehicles are becoming more and more connected and we need to push updates and they are really critical updates, right? Like if so who needs to, like the department needs to push updates to the vehicles? No. Okay. The OEMs, okay. like GM, Mercedes, ah, fair enough. Like okay, got it. Um, need to push updates to the vehicle um, because there's, let's take a step back, right? Um, your car right now has 100 million lines of code. And that's crazy. Like not, we, a <laughs> not a Tesla. Not a Tesla. Not a Tesla. Right. And if you think of your average iPhone app, right. they range from 60,000 lines of code. Mm. So if something that has 60,000 lines of code is getting updated 
like at least once a month your iPhone app. Imagine something that is hundred or thousand times big, right? A car. And you cannot have a perfect car when you sell it, right? When there are so many dependencies, there's always recall that will happen. Right. Right now, there are so many problems with recalls. Like OEM industries are spending $50 billion in recalls. And during one of the conferences, it was mentioned that 25 billion of those recalls could be prevented if they had software updates that they could do. Right. Tesla does a lot of software oh, updates. Yes. I keep keep hearing about them. Yeah. I've never heard from any other car manufacturer exactly. doing updates yeah. over there. Okay, so your technology, uh, so Uptain is basically a framework exactly. for those over the air updates and then you are uh, sort of using machine learning or AI to uh, make it more secure. Exactly. Uh, for so for we manufacturers. Are adopting that framework and uh, we are avoiding a lot of different attacks that could happen during a data transfer, mm -hmm. like eavesdrop attack, right? Somebody could be listening on to the uh, data transfer that's happening. Right. Um, that's is, a read. Is it a similar to end-to-end uh, uh, -end encryption that exactly. messaging companies do? Exactly. So okay. That's exactly what we're doing. We are the next gen way of encrypting. So Got right it. now, um, anything that you see around you is using single point verification or encryption. Hmm. And what we are advocating... What, uh, oh, what's yeah. a single point verification? <laughs> sure. Um, so whenever you're encrypting something, you generate keys, right? Okay. You generate multiple keys to encrypt that data. And all of that data is being stored at one location. Hmm. And if that one location is compromised, hmm. everything is lost, even if there were measures taken to have multiple keys. Got it. And uh, what we are advocating for is multi-point verification. Mm. So even if one location is compromised, you are not giving out all of that of data at all. Like we pride ourselves in saying that even if there is an unsecured line, we can have a secure communication happen uh, in that. Got it. And how long have you been working on, on this and where, where are you now? Yeah, it's barely been, been a month. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we are right in the middle of the pivot right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and what do you expect to have you talked to um, automobile manufacturers or, or others and what's, what's their reaction to this? Yeah, so uh, it's an amazing time to be part of this industry right now. Um, because of a couple of reasons, right? One of them is Uptain is getting IEEE certified, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a standard for automobiles um, yeah. very soon. And my co-founder is actually part of the team writing the specifications um, to get uh, it a compliant. Second, if, I don't know if you saw the automation day at Tesla mm -hmm. that was happening. Yeah, I heard about it, <laughs> I didn't see it. So they're launching a, a fleet, right? Um, of Tesla's um, like robo taxis right right right, right. and uh, for that thing to happen they will need to send an over the air update to the current fleet that exists and mm -hmm. that's exactly what we secure right when there is a communication that is happening over the air or wired right between two entities uh, we secure that communication so so you are just going to focus on all the automobile manufacturers who want to uh, so I'm that's our long-term strategy. We understand that the sales cycle is really long. Yeah, uh, yeah. When it it's comes not going to be a couple OEMs. of months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why we're focusing also on the IoT devices okay. and the cameras and things like that. Um, anywhere where there is an update that needs to be pushed to a firmware, um, like a software or firmware update, uh, you need security. There's a lot of vulnerabilities. We make the devices smart enough to understand that whether the data can like they are getting is coming from an authentic and a trustworthy source or not. Right, so it basically prevents someone, as they show in movies, someone takes over a whole grid or a whole set of devices and make them do what they want to do. Exactly, we so, prevent that. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so would be helpful in all those movies if, yeah. <laughs> if you had that. Uh, cool, so, so you're in the middle of the pivot and, and how How's the experience of a pivot? Uh, not not a lot of people, I think. May, a lot of people go through a pivot very early on before a product is out, or, right. or as as they are as they are <coughs> uh, bringing out a product. But uh, after signing up so many ambulances and so many companies and and having some some revenue and some traction, uh, how the how how's the pivot 
process after that? How do you convince your investors and, and right. co-founders and employees to, to actually uh, move in a new direction? Right. I mean, it's a crazy, like, it's very challenging because mm-hmm. as a founder, you have spent years pitching the same idea. You have developed expertise in that field. And suddenly, you're like, shit, right. the ground has moved. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it is a decision that, of course, we had to have with each stakeholder, right? We had to have one-on-one discussions with the team members, the co-founders, the investors, um, the customers also, right? Like, so it was a whole process. It was not something that happened overnight. It was a very calculated move. And it made sense for us because we had given three, four years of our time to replenish and uh, the change that we wanted to see and the impact and the acceptance of technology was not at the level we had anticipated. Uh, so sometimes you also have to go after the money, right? Yeah, 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 yeah fair enough. Yeah. So, so as you're sort of, as you have moved from India uh, to the US, and uh, been doing companies for for many years what are the things what are some some surprising things that you learned um, early on or or as you as you went on to sort of uh, do different businesses uh, some something some challenges you faced or or things that you learned that could be helpful to others listening to this sure um, I mean, at every stage, you're always learning, right? Mm-hmm. When you, I first moved here, it, the challenge was accepting who I was and being confident in myself, right? Mm-hmm. That was the first challenge that I had to face because you were in your comfort zone back in your country and suddenly everything that was your like comfort zone, your friends, your family, you were displaced and move to a new country, new culture, new exposure to everything. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's excitement because, you know, it's America. New people, new culture, all of that. You have heard so many things. But at the end of the day, you have to become part of, assimilate with the whole ecosystem, right? right? So I I became extremely shy when I first moved, right? Mm. (laughs) Complete opposite now. But (laughs) when I first moved in, it was just like, I don't know what I will say. Do people even understand what I'm trying to say? Because I have a very thick accent, right? So it was a learning curve back in the day. And my like advice is, like looking back on it, be confident. You will be surprised how accepting people are of the culture and the values that you come to. Especially in the Bay Area, yeah, I feel like yeah. that's more true, um, yeah. more than anywhere else. Yeah, so... Yeah. No, any like even when I was in Boston, right? Um, there were two very particular instances that I had. So that was the first time I had moved away from Bay Area and exposed to an ecosystem that was maybe not... living away from family and exactly. amongst very different people. Exactly, and people were so intrigued to learn about your culture, right? And they were so open. It also taught me to have an open mind, right? Like you know, any time when I'm going to a new situation, like making judgments or anything like that is not going to take you anywhere Mm. right be confident in yourself there are so many things that about you beyond the culture and all of that that people also identify and see so connect beyond those stereotypes and uh, so so that's like more younger and on a personal level at a a company level on a professional side as you talk to investors as, as you talk to employees uh what kind of things had did you have to learn Right. As you as you sort of grew the grew replenish. Right. Um, see, doing sales is all about connecting with the person that's across the table from you, right? Mm-hmm. And my interests were very like distinct, right? Mm-hmm. I love Bollywood music, <laughs> right? Yeah. So usually when you're talking about music, sports, all of those right. things come up. Right. So being comfortable in your own skin, mm-hmm. but still being able to have a conversation mm. about that and being open to learning right. is also a way to connect with people. So that was a learning curve for me. In other terms, um, like pitching, right? I remember uh, talking to a coach uh, who was also a mentor mm-hmm. and telling me small things, right? Like, 
Oh, when you start the pitch, just say, hi everyone. It brings all the audience together. And if you see any other pitch that I've done after that conversation, it starts with that. Right, <laughs> right? so small, small uh, things uh, to have a pitch or connect with the audience, things like that. So cool. Which is funny. your favorite Bollywood song right now? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult really, question. <laughs> yeah. I'm really addicted to Apna Time Aiga. Okay. Um, yeah. It's yeah. a pretty, pretty good song. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you like uh, think about the next few years of, of your entrepreneurial journey as you as you um, start as as you do OTA info? Yeah. It's very exciting times for us right now. Because uh, like things are moving fast, hmm. <laughs> and when I say fast, they are moving like I've never done anything at such speed at replenish, hmm. right? Like we are releasing a product in two weeks, right? Like from uh, from start. No, yeah. no, we oh, just from finished start. our MVP right. yesterday. Okay. But since like one week into the idea, we had a few meetings, all of that. And we're like, okay, let's go build this product. In two weeks, we build that product. We are doing demos tomorrow with a series of people, right? So that is a timeline that we did not see in Replenish. Mm. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of acceptance from mm. customers. Right. Um, so I'm excited for the next few years, I'm kind of taking this and creating a new field and new way to encrypt data. Awesome. I think that's yeah. a good note to, to end, the, end the interview. Sure. Thanks for coming over uh, and talking to us. You know you're super busy with the updates, <laughs> but uh, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Cool.